Homeschool Journey 101. Thank you so much for watching. And I'm also going to thank you for subscribing. It's so encouraging to us when we see people uh, subscribing or, or giving us a thumbs up. And if you find yourself enjoying this video, we hope you'll consider subscribing or, or liking it as well. So epic projects are something that, oh, I just look back at homeschooling and I feel like these are just such joyful experiences that I really wanted to um, make a video about it. And so uh, luckily two of my very dear friends feel the same, Yvette Adele and Renee Capuano will also be joining us on this video to give us their family's experiences. Epic projects have so many advantages. You know, maybe in this day and age, one of the biggest ones is there are ways to get your children away from social media, away from the computer, away from war games, and involved in life, right? Involved in real things and sometimes in fresh airs, but in these creative, open-ended situations that allow them to really start thinking about multiple solutions or, you know, ways to collaborate together. Uh, the other thing about them that we find over and over again is that something about these big projects and working on them and figuring out how things connect and how processes work together, right? It really is such something that helps your child develop in a very different way. Understanding what it's going to take, not just the hard work, but the idea that a process is going to happen, that one thing leads to the other, and seeing it through is, is a skill that will just go with them whatever they decide to do. So, you know, I've talked about creativity, I've talked about higher level thinking, I've talked about character development, but I just really want to say one more time, it's also just so fun for your kids. When your kids are sitting around the Thanksgiving table, these epic projects are the things that we, we all find our kids talking about over and over again. And it's funny 10 years later, and I know it's going to be even funnier 20 years later. But as the people, the, the people who were the parents, we find ourselves looking back and thinking, the other thing about these epic projects is that we can see that they helped our children become who we wanted them to be, to become people of substance, to become people of uh, flexibility, to become people who knew how to make something work, they, people who were resilient, people who knew how to get back on the horse again and ride. Um, these, are, these are just wonderful experiences. And so this is why we wanted to make this video. We don't necessarily think you'll want to do our exact ideas. But we do hope that this will give you, you know, a chance to kind of think of a framework of how these epic projects might work for your family. So let's get started. So when you're thinking about an epic project, a big project that's going to happen over time, it's kind of important to think about three breakdowns, I would say, of how these go together. So one idea is a parent-led project. And Renee is going to talk to you later about, you know, an amazing project, some amazing, she's done so many amazing projects, but one of her amazing projects. And this is a case where she's deciding what's going to happen. But for the most part, uh, her children are, are, are learning in, in through her instruction, but she's still definitely the person in charge. If that's going to talk to you about idea of a completely opposite, where the it's child-led program, the child is going to think to themselves, I'd like to do this project, and then it's completely on their own, and the parent's role is really supportive, mostly like, hey, can you take me to this place, or can you buy me these supplies so that I can make this happen? I'm going to start off with sort of a middle ground idea, where Parents are involved in the project, but it's still very much a project that the children are making uh, a lot of the decisions on their own. So it's kind of in the middle. So my children very much enjoyed building forts. Uh, they built so many forts that I don't even know how many they built. I, want, I, I think they might have built a hundred, no, or something really large, maybe more like 70 forts outdoors. And they were from everything from mud bricks to uh, just uh, in the beginning, just uh, sort of like flat pieces of wood um, that uh, were arranged different ways to sort of mark out a town that they had made. But as they were going along, they were through trial and error learning to make more and more complicated structures. I definitely, um, you know, would bring them, the, get them the supplies that they would need. I knew that this was something that they loved to do, but I also was involved in the sense of always sort of talking them through like, well, what would you like to do next? But I didn't go out there with them and help them actually in any way build for. I made sure that they had the tools. I made sure that they had safety ideas, but they were doing it completely on their own. And they loved being able to come back to me and surprise me with, 
look, we figured out, you know, how to put on a roof. Look, we, we, we figured out how to uh, make a sort of stone area and have a little simple wood burning stove, but we need, we need piping, you know, all kinds of, of pieces got more and more complicated along the way. Um, other kids might have really not enjoyed that, but as if you watched my earlier videos about scheduling and getting started, you know that one thing I did was offer my children a very long lunch break in the middle of a couple hours. And so they, this is something they like to work on over and over and over again, is, is working through these skills. And you can kind of think of how doing this does all those things we talked about, right? You can think of how this is creative thinking, but how it's also slowly helping them build through the process to, to build more and more and more complicated things. So one time we had just moved to a new house and something that they very much were missing was living right on the lake. We still live very near a lake in Michigan, but they instead had wetlands and a very small pond. And so because they had been continuing to build their skills and think through things, they came to my husband and I and said, we'd like to make a big pond. And we, you know, it's, our, our first thought was, ah, no, but then we said, well, you know, why don't you research it a little bit? Why don't you think through, you know, how that would work and bring us back a plan? So we're not actually saying to them, just go do whatever you want, but we're also not, we're not really in charge of this either. This is something in between. So they started to draw out some plans. Uh, they wanted to go to a nature center that we went to often where they had found out that a person who uh, worked in, did, had a lot to do with the watershed in our area was going to be giving a talk and so after that person's talk they just kind of went up and started you know pouncing on uh, this uh, scientist with their questions about how they could go about this uh, through that scientist they also they were able to get one of his uh, grad students to come out and talk them through even in more detail uh, you know what they would need to do to in this particular case, they had to collect many, many, many frogs, you know, dozens of frogs that were going to have their habitat uh, wrecked. And more importantly, uh, the eggs and the tadpoles and keep them in these huge bins. Um, they had to learn about what was going to be necessary to keep these creatures alive for, you know, the weeks it was going to take them to complete this project. Also had to do this with some of the, um, salamanders and some other little creatures that were in the area. Uh, this was the job of the younger children. They spent hours and hours, you know, carefully catching these things and cataloging them and, you know, sitting on the porch, you know, writing down you know, how many of each species they had and uh, what was going to be, like, you know, the next step. And, uh, you know, at one time, you know, having to call an expert to say, you know, it doesn't look like these frogs are eating, you know, what should we do? And so you can sort of see how this becomes a life of its own, right? This becomes a passion, this becomes a joy, and this involves all those things that you're, you're hoping for. The, you know, everyone was involved in that to a certain extent, but the middle kids really took it upon themselves to draw out the boundary of the pond, to start working on, you know, removing brush, removing small trees, and sort of digging and starting to do the beginning of digging out. Well, it became pretty clear that our children were very passionate about this and they dug for so long, but we realized that this is just going to take forever. So we agreed to rent a small excavator and pay for someone to come out and show us how to use it. It was a very small digger. I guess it might not really be called an excavator. And um, there's, there's some physics involved in that. There's a lot of thinking in how to, how, how long the pond could be, how to dam up the sort of creek in a way that there would still be a wetlands, but there would still be an area where the water could flow. Uh, you know, what kind of pipe or culvert was going to be necessary. All of this came into part of our children learning about how to make this much larger pond. Um, when it was complete, you know, it wasn't over because then we also had to do a whole other project of what to do with the remaining um, sandy soil, sandy dirt. And that, that became its a, a, another epic project, actually. But my kids had so much fun with that pond. They ice skated it in the winter like they had hoped to. Um, they had a paddle boat and built endless sort of log rafts to go around it in the summer. And part of the joy for them was is this is something that they had created that they had thought through that they had planned out and they had successfully executed and yes the creatures 
almost all lived and thrived. And you know, even just listening to the you know, cacophony of sound of the frogs forever, you know, they can look back and think like, oh, you know, we made that happen. This is why it's important to do that piece of it. So this is just one example, but one thing to really think about in this idea is that idea of even though the parent, we as the parents were involved along the way, uh, very much this wasn't a case where they were just doing whatever they wanted. We weren't that involved in every single aspect of it. There was lots of choices that they were making on their own and pieces of it that they were doing together as a unit to figure out like how can we make this epic project work and what's it going to take to keep working on this over weeks and weeks and weeks to have this final result. And what pieces are necessary for success? You know, is the culvert necessary? Um, how about the banks of the pond? How do we make sure that they don't erode? Like, are, are we gonna need to bring in, which is necessary and part of it, so, some large boulders? So there's so many pieces that come together that help your child realize like how this is going to work is going to be not, there's not just one answer, right? There's different ways to go about it and end up with your best possible end story. So, so before we get into um, the next two segments, I just want to sort of kind of list a variety of epic projects that we have had the joy of knowing people that done. So one thing is I've known several people who had their children sort of start their own small business. Uh, my boys, very good friends, uh, did a small business on hummingbird feeders that they did very well on. And then they built from there up and up and up until now as young men, they started their own very successful businesses. So this is an example of one thing leading to the other. I know a young man who did a lot of electrical work with the father of a friend that again built and built and built until he eventually decided to become an electrician. My children were fascinated with cement being poured after seeing part of you know sort of part of that pond project and found themselves you know very much enjoying going to help and be part of a project of, of working with cement and stone even though that's not something that they did for their you know life career this is this is the idea of how epic projects sort of expand and make kids interested more and more in things we know someone who built a life-size catapult as part of a project about the Middle Ages. There's many people who will choose to do things for history, and here's some pictures of a huge project that my children, with Yvette's children, did on Egypt. They were the number of them were so interested in Egypt, and so. In this particular situation, they're going to dress up like uh, people from Egypt. They're going to do plays about Egypt. They're going to learn some music to play about Egypt. They're all very musical. They're going to uh, go to museums in the big city of uh, Chicago uh, to uh, be able to explore that in that way. We're going to hire a guest speaker to come talk to them. And they're going to do tons of projects, that all small projects, that all fit together into sort of a, you know, Egypt Day, or it could be an Egypt muse Egyptian museum. Th this is one way to, to make these things kind of come, come alive. If your children, for example, love music, there's so many things that we, we you know, we talked about this in, um, before, but um, there's so many thing, pieces that they can use music for in, you know, writing their own opera, writing their own piece to play for church. It could be, you know, that they go every week to, in, you know, in a different time, to the nursing home to play for people. Um, and they build in that becomes a bigger project for them it doesn't just stop there that maybe they're going to in, instead you know make out of that a much bigger thing where they have a choir and they come up with some original pieces to to present so there's so many different things that you can do i mean i'm just barely touching the surface but I really want you to hear from Yvette and Renee about their projects and their styles. So Renee is going to talk next, and you're just going to love the pictures she has of her fabulous children. These are her five youngest children, and these pictures are amazing. Um, but don't don't stop watching. Stick around for Yvette at the end, who is whose children did projects like build a six foot balsa plane, build a boat that actually worked in the water and hot air balloons. Her son eventually um, has gone on to become an engineer, but there's so many great projects to come. So let's start with Renee. Oh, I'm just gonna love these pictures. Thanks, Helen. 
Um, I really enjoyed hearing about the projects that you did with your kids when they were younger. And, uh, you know, this is such a great opportunity as a homeschooler. Um, you have the time, you're setting your schedule, you're working it in with your curriculum, you're working it in with what you're doing. And it's a, it's a great opportunity for not only for you to work with your kids, but for them to show off everything they've been learning and to really hone those problem solving skills. And then on top of all of that, you may not, it may not look like there's a lot of academics going on in these epic projects, but that's really where everything they've been learning comes together. And that's where when we've been talking about the joy and giving your kids opportunities, um, this is going to spur them to want to learn more, to want to do more, and to want to implement what they know and figure out what they don't know. And they're going to want to go and learn what they don't know because they want to, they want to complete that project and they want it to be a fantastic um, outcome. Um, so I really enjoyed hearing about your projects. Uh, we started this project this summer, um, a garden project very similar to what you were doing. Uh, we started in early April. And, and what I really like about this project and really what it did for us uh, was you start with nothing. We started with nothing. My children had never been gardeners. They'd never done landscaping. So they had to start from square one, which was planning. Where are we going to put this garden? Looking over the whole property. Where? Why do we need to find the best spot? Why can't we put it wherever we want? Um, and then once they decided on a spot and the pros and cons of that spot, um, the one thing we did do is we, we, uh, they built with their dad, they built some garden boxes, and then we had a, an excavator come in and fill them with, with a dirt on another side of our property. Uh, but after that, it was really all their project. Um, I was there to supervise, to help them uh, with their planning, to answer questions, to give them their next steps, but they did all of the work. And whatever roadblocks and challenges came up, they had to figure out how to deal with those. Um, so they started with nothing from, you'll see in these pictures when they had their garden boxes, the dirt was all clumpy and not usable, and they had to rake it and break it down and uh, make turn it into a, a Good soil to put their seeds in and to put their plants in. And once they got started with that, they, they realized they had they, they wanted to do more. So they had their raised beds and then they wanted to plant in the ground. Uh, but we didn't have a tiller, we didn't have any equipment. So they had to dig all by hand. They dug their entire garden by hand, the additional garden spots. And, and then they still had more that they wanted to plant. So then they had uh, garden pots. So you'll see in some of these pictures, they're filling the garden pots and deciding which plants to put in each of those pots. Um, and it was a lot of work. And there was no payoff in the beginning when you're digging in late April, early May, and it's still dark and dreary out. There's not a lot of even buds on the trees in some cases. And, and then they have to wait. And this is such a great project to learn patience because they plant it, but they can't do anything for weeks and weeks and weeks before they're going to be able to uh, see any results of what they've done. And the garden looks kind of bleak at that point. Um, the other thing that they wanted to do and, and what we decided were we gonna plant sunflowers, thousands of sunflowers. So they dug all the way around the perimeter of our property and they planted their sunflowers and it was a, a an arduous task um, to dig it all by hand and they would be planting their sunflowers they would go along and measure uh, how far apart each seed would be and then they'd watch a little bird would be watching them and they'd watch the bird and the bird would come along behind them dig out their seed and eat it um, so uh, they had to figure out a plan to keep their birds out. So we bought some netting that they stapled the netting down all around the property. Um, and what happened, you know, Helen talked about these fails. Here was a big fail. Uh, they planted thousands of sunflowers. And even though they put up safeguards, the birds did come and eat all of their seeds. The chipmunks came and ate all of their seeds and none of those sunflowers grew. Um, and it was very disappointing to have that happen. Uh, but what did they do? They had their notebooks, they took notes, 
Uh, they made a plan for what they're going to do next year. Um, and they planted more sunflowers and this time they planted them inside of the garden fence. So when we're talking about starting this project from nothing, after they planted their garden, they put a fence all the way around. You'll see in this picture, they have their ladder out there and they're, they're pounding in their fence posts and they fenced everything in and then they planted their sunflowers inside the fence. And, uh, and those sunflowers survived. And eventually they were able to go out and uh, enjoy these sunflowers. But every day they would go out to look at the progress of their garden. And, and some days, uh, like Helen was talking about, they didn't wanna go out. So no one went out to the garden that day and watered. No one went out and weeded. Uh, maybe it was three or four days before that would happen. And the weeds would come up and things would dry out and they would see that uh, their garden was starting to stall out. And it was creating much more work for them to come back in and fix all of those problems that were occurring because they were negligent, because they had something else they'd rather be doing than working on their garden. Um, so you're, you'll see pictures of them out there weeding every day. Then what, what happened, what eventually happened, something started to grow. And the, the, uh, you'll see in this box, you'll see that the, the garden box grew the fastest. So for weeks, the only thing they would have would be the different lettuces from their garden. And the joy and the excitement that they planted it themselves, they would cut that lettuce and they would take it in. You can see they have these big bowls of all their different, their romaine and their uh, butter crisp lettuce. And they would have salads at every meal. They'd have salads at breakfast. They were one of them was putting uh, lettuce on their peanut butter sandwiches. Um, they were just so excited. And then they would go out and rove around the garden. What can we eat next? What's going to grow next? Um, and there was a lot of excitement. They had a lot of things that grew in this garden, but they had a lot of things that died. They planted dozens and dozens of cucumbers and rows and rows of cucumbers. You can see them out there with the cucumbers in this picture. And they maybe got 15 cucumbers all summer. And most of them were some pretty uh, unattractive looking cucumbers. <laughs> um, so they had things die. The next thing that the, the roadblock they had is once the garden started going, um, then the animals wanted to come in. And even though they put up this fence, um, they did not secure the fence netting around the bottom. And I explained to them how to do that and gave them all the, the tools they needed, uh, but they were, uh, weren't were particularly diligent in that. And there were a lot of gaps and holes. So the rabbits got in, the, some other animals got in. They saw moles were digging around and they were chasing the moles around with their shovels, trying to get rid of the moles. Um, they would go to the garden and see holes dug in their strawberries. They'd planted a whole bed of strawberries. They'd see bites out of all their little strawberries. Something had been in there eating them. Um, so here's another hurdle, another challenge, another roadblock to them getting to eat those strawberries. So they had to figure out what to do. They had to go all the way around the garden again and secure all of that netting so that the animals had a harder time getting in. Um, and they had to fill up the holes. So there are a lot of lessons here learned, a lot of uh, critical thinking, problem solving, a lot of disappointments. They put so much work into some of these um, projects and, and, and what happened, it was a failure. There were no sunflowers, the cucumbers didn't turn out. Uh, but there were so many joys in other areas. They planted a giant pumpkin, a farmer came and helped them with their pumpkin told them everything they needed to do to grow this giant pumpkin. And that pumpkin was a lot of work. Every day they had to go out and bury the vines. They had to water this pumpkin. This pumpkin takes about 60 gallons of water a week to grow. So this was a huge watering project. They had to water it the right way. They really had to baby this plant. And uh, there were times they didn't like to go out and do it. Um, they maybe they'd forgotten to do it and they were running out after dark to water this got this this giant pumpkin uh but, and then if you know anything about giant pumpkins which we didn't know they had to research it they had to keep calling the farmer talking to the farmer about it and um 
they had to, to take off all of the blossoms that were going to grow pumpkins because they couldn't grow it right away. They had to wait for the right time. And finally, they had a pumpkin growing. And every day they'd go out and they would just stare at their pumpkin. And they loved to look at this pumpkin. And once this pumpkin starts growing, it grows a lot each day. So they could see. Eventually, this pumpkin took over the whole end of the garden. It was growing up their, their fence and uh, up their sunflowers that had, that had grown inside the fence. And now the most visible thing in their garden is that giant pumpkin, which is, is over 220 pounds and still growing. Um, and it's very exciting for them. They stand in the garden and they, they eat their tomatoes, they eat their beans, um, and they come in and it's, it's a full circle project because they do get to eat everything that's in that garden. So they make their green beans for dinner and they're the ones who wash the beans, they snip the beans, they put them in the pan. Um, they do all of that. They've been making sauce with their tomatoes. So they have to, to I do the boiling of the tomatoes, they peel the tomatoes themselves, they chop the tomatoes, they get the basil from the gar their garden. Uh, the first frost was coming just this past weekend, just last night. And uh, they were out there late in the garden trying to pull everything out that they thought might be damaged. So they pulled all of their basil leaves and they stayed up late last night and pulled off all of their leaves, leaves to get them prepared to store them uh, so they, they could use them in their sauce that they were going to make over the weekend so that they could have it over the winter. And it, it sounds like something, and these are five little boys, uh, not so little, I guess, uh, middle school boys. Um, why would they be so concerned about their basil? Because they wanted to get their basil in their spaghetti sauce because they liked the way it tasted. And the thing I found out is they like a lot of vegetables because they grew them themselves. Um, so they're eating eggplant, some of them that never ate eggplant before because they grew that eggplant in their garden and they couldn't wait to try it. So in addition to all of these lessons that they were learning with their successes and with their failures, this project really spurred an enthusiasm in them um, about where their food grows, what kind of food they can grow, and they felt like they were so knowledgeable about it. Um, we started going to uh, local orchards and picking things that we didn't have in our garden. Um, we didn't have cherry trees. We didn't have an orchard. So we'd go to the orchard and they picked cherries for a couple of weeks when the cherries were good and coming. Uh, they picked plums. You can see these pictures of them picking plums. Um, we'd never seen a plum tree before, but this orchard had um, orchards full of plum trees, Italian plums. So you can see uh, they'd hold each other up on their shoulders and they would be picking plums. They would climb ladders and pick the cherries. And, and um, not only was this fun and exciting for them, there was a lot of teamwork. Uh, how are they gonna get those cherries? Who's gonna hold the boxes? Um, how are they gonna get them to the car? Uh, then all summer long, we decided we went about once or twice a week to this orchard and they picked strawberries, blueberries, um, then the vegetables started coming and they were picking green beans, they picked tomatoes, they picked uh, boxes and boxes full of hot peppers, jalapenos, habaneros, uh, spicy chili peppers. And um, they bring these home and you can see in these pictures, they'd fill up their whole picnic table with berries and vegetables, uh, bell peppers. And then the process would start. They, we, we'd make salsa and we canned salsa. And this was a project, a group project, where I would explain, they would read the recipe together. They'd pick out the best recipes. These, my, my children love to read recipes. And they'd make the, uh, they'd chop all of the peppers themselves, chop all of the onions. Um, the only real part of the project I would do were the things that would be on the stove that would be, um, maybe that I didn't want them to do. So I would boil the tomatoes for them and then I would do the canning, but they would be there for all the process of the canning, putting the, can the jars in the water, taking the jars out and the enthusiasm to eat that salsa. 
They want to eat that again at every meal. They want to get out a jar of salsa. And I, I remind them, I thought we were going to save this for when we didn't, when the garden was no longer growing and we didn't have fresh vegetables. But they're tossing salsa on top of everything. Um, they're learning why the peppers are spicy and so hot. Why do those peppers burn my hands if I don't wear gloves? Um, so you can see then they look every week to see what's going to be picking at the orchard next week. Oh, next week they're going to have the gala apples. Oh, next week, we, oh, we got the blondies. We got the golden, when are the golden delicious? They keep waiting. So we go to the orchard and we'll walk around to see what's coming next. Um, so there's always something new at the orchard. So to supplement what they were getting in their garden, they go to this orchard. Um, and it's, it's again, another full circle project. They wanted peaches, but there was too much frost at the beginning of the year. And so the orchard didn't have peaches this year. So we'd have to go to the, 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 the market and buy peaches for their recipes. Um, and we didn't have that opportunity. So they learned that the farmer also has these disappointments, um, that it's based on the weather, that it's based on other factors. They'd go to the orchard and they'd see uh, the fox holes and the foxes coming out and they'd watch the fox uh, walk around the orchard. Um, so they would see how all of this works together on a farm in a larger scale um, from what we were doing at home on this smaller scale. And they'd see the rewards of spending the afternoon picking. Because sometimes it wasn't so much fun picking blueberries when it's 96 degrees outside. Um, but then they'd come home and they'd have blueberry pie or blueberry jam and they count their jars of jam and they, they love to look in the freezer and see how many bags of, of corn do we have. Um, and they'd get the farmer's corn at the orchard but then it was so exciting when their ears of corn started coming in and they'd go pick their corn and they'd eat their own corn. Um, so there's a, a lot of excitement as, that can come with these projects as well as the disappointment. When you hear Helen's uh, talking about her children using their pond in the winter and in the summer, um, this is a satisfaction that is only gotten by doing that hard work. And you've taught them those lessons and you've taught them that when they don't do the hard work, that there's gonna be almost certain failure. And you've also taught them there's some things that are out of their control, that you can work really hard and still you're going to lose all of your sunflowers or your watermelon's not going to grow or uh, you're, you're, you don't even know why your cucumbers didn't grow. You're going to have to do some more research. Um, and you taught them how to deal with the, and handle those disappointments. And as Helen said, get back on that horse and uh, figure out what to do next. How are you gonna proceed from here? What will you do? Will you forget about your garden now? Are you so mad that it didn't grow that you're just not going back to that garden ever? Um, or are you gonna figure something else out? Or are you gonna find joy in another place? Find joy in your tomatoes. Um, it's a great project and these long-term projects are such good character builders, building tools for your children um, and your homeschool. So I'm glad you're doing this episode. Thanks, Helen. Yvette, you were so brilliant at early on, even before a lot of people were doing this, doing project-based learning and, and, and having a home environment where your children really could kind of create their own projects. So if you could tell us a little bit about some of the different projects that you did, and I'm thinking of the famous uh, hot air balloon and balsa, gigantic balsa plane, six foot long balsa plane that um, Ben made, uh, who of course, uh, you know, went on to go to college and become an engineer. But as a high schooler, if you could talk about those, uh, you know, epic projects of his, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, my son seemed to develop an interest in um, in in flight. I guess you might say um, he, uh, he started out by building a hot air balloon out of uh, little strips of wood and paper, and it was it was huge. I mean, um, you know, if you if you took two people, you might be able to put your arms 
is probably a little bit bigger than that, putting your arms all the way around this hot air balloon, uh, that he had uh, the energy for the hot air was from um, candles inside a little platform. So he built that all himself, like the whole shape of it. Um, and like, you know, it was a little bit like a sewing project and actually maybe it even stemmed from his, uh, his times doing sewing projects because I had a sewing machine and we, we did sew a few things and so he did so uh, learn how to use that sewing machine too. So I think that the, the pattern and the way things fit together might have come yet from another project that he had done um, in the sewing. So anyway, when it came time for that, uh, for the lift off for the hot air balloon, we invited some friends. It was really cold outside. It was uh, in Michigan winter and um, and so there was snow on the ground, which was a good thing because um, because the cold helped us to keep the heat inside of the hot air balloon. And so then it lifted up and it, it went it went a fair height, and then uh, then it caught fire and crashed. So it was very exciting, which always uh, added to the story so much. <laughs> of course, of course, it was fun, and everybody ran out to see if they could rescue any parts of it. But, um, and I think maybe he built a couple of those. He tried a few different ways uh, and it was completely uh, self-driven. I, I don't have any interest in building things that fly uh, at all and I don't have any knowledge in it either. He just really was um, constantly thinking about how these things work. Um, and then uh, for a while he was, um, it seemed like he was very quiet and he was in his room a lot and he came out asking for some, some, some supplies, more balsa wood and some saran wrap and uh, he was, you know, looking for measuring tools and uh, he had found some design plans to build your own glider out of balsa wood and, uh, and saran wrap and so he created this thing, it was almost too big to get in the car. Um, and asked us if we would take him to um, some place that had a nice hill so he could give it a flight because it was just a glider. And um, uh, we had to go out to the dune because uh, Michigan is pretty flat. So uh, it didn't work so well the first couple times. It just kind of like, uh, you know, like, you know, when you're making a paper airplane and it just dives. So there were some... Um, some some failures and it sent him back into the drawing room and he you know we went we went out three or four times and finally we got a really good flight out of that and um, it was it was a lot of fun and it was really satisfying uh, and that inspired him for the next step of the big project which was to say hey mom I think I want to do pilot license um, so Oh yeah, that sounds like a really great idea. But um, <laughs> we're following his lead and he's getting math and he's getting uh, design and he's getting uh, trial and error and he's getting like self-motivation. And, um, and so like in my mind, like I'm an educator by training, by education myself. So like I'm checking off all these boxes as I'm watching my son unfold and so he was about 15 and 16 when he was doing all this and so <clears throat> he asked if he could go take flying lessons and uh, we found a coupon for free flight uh, free first lesson and we went to the little community airport and uh, and the instructor took him up and uh, he actually flew you know she gave him the controls and he flew the airplane you know, I think these pro these giant projects, and then, um, as I recall, Ben even did a series of jobs working to get that, you know, to get all those um, hours that he needed for the pilot's license. I think this is a great example of that process that, that we talk about, that um, one great thing about homeschooling and one great thing about project-based learning is this idea of learning that good things may take a long, long time. It may be that one thing leads to the other, one thing leads to the other, but it's the, the process might begin here, but a long process may be necessary for um, the end result that you want. And I think that this is uh, an excellent example of someone who was willing to really go all out to see that all the way through. 
Right, and the and the uh, the pilot lessons was completely funded by him. And yes, he did. Uh, he he worked at the airport for a while, like cleaning out airplanes, uh, so that he could pay for his lessons. So, um, you know, this is the interesting thing about um, about projects and uh, like where they can go. You don't always know where they're going to go, um, and it's not like you can all the time plan it and have it like ABC. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about one project in particular when he was really young, and, I, and this project really gave me an important lesson. And uh, this was an art project, so super simple. And the art project was you take a light bulb. It's just one of the old-fashioned light bulbs because you have to break the light bulb, and you would not want to do that this in these days with these light bulbs. But anyway, you take a light bulb and you paper mache the whole thing. You let it dry and then you whack the light bulb and the glass inside breaks and you have a little maraca. And then you paint your maraca and it's really cool. Well, we got all the way up to the break the glass inside part and he would not finish this project. And I was like, we're gonna finish this project. <laughs> and I was so adamant about completion and I, I don't remember who I was like, like whining to. One of my friends, I, you need support. So like one of my homeschooling friends, maybe it was you, Helen, I don't remember, but they said to me, well, you know, maybe he just learned everything he needed to learn about that project and you don't need to finish it. And how true, it was like, once you got all the concepts, maybe the rest of it is, superfluous and you don't really need to but the, but it is interesting because it didn't teach him to not finish things because when his glider didn't fail when his glider failed the first few flights he didn't quit he finished it you know so it's one not thing you, absolutely I one thing you and I talked about a lot in our early homeschooling is that we wanted our children to not be afraid to fail right we wanted them to be people who would try things and if things didn't work out to try again and again and again i think we were really successful about that too but <laughs> it's those little pieces right well i was really hung up on finishing it's hard so, to be that's why that's why i said i learned a lot in that that little project <laughs> and you know i just uh, read this really interesting book called range and it talks about how uh, some scientists, or like Kepler, when they couldn't get the right answer, they would then think of wrong answers to arrive at a right answer. So like purposefully putting yourself so far out of the box that you know you're wrong. And then you can eventually come backwards to the right answer. I thought that was a really interesting concept. So Brilliant. just give thought. That's a, that's a brilliant point. So in this video, I feel like we've talked a lot about science projects, but projects could be in any sort of, um, you know, genre that you wanted. And I think that your youngest daughter might have a great example of an epic art project. Uh, it was an epic art project and, um, and I had to kind of make a deal because, um, she was so into it that I felt like I could piggyback something that I wanted onto it. And um, she uh, is a photographer. Uh, she's um, an art major right now in her last semester with an emphasis in photography. So she grabbed our digital camera way back in the day when they first came out. And um, she was in charge of it. I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing how she loved that thing and took pictures of everything. Um, and uh, one time um, we were talking about shadows and so she took about a million pictures of a rake in the sunlight and that was like a micro project that began into more serious photography that ended up being part of her senior high school project and so um, uh, we said we said at one point I think we should have a show I think we should have like a culmination of all of this artwork uh, all this photography that you do and have a show but I also want it to be part of uh, your cello recital and so 
he was really in charge of uh, getting the photos printed, getting them matted, doing the hanging, and um, making, and of course, practicing her cello and um, making the program and um, renting the space and inviting the people. So that was, that's a project where I could have just taken over and say, I'll do everything, which actually I did all the food, so I did all that. <laughs> but I mean, like the whole rest of it was really, she was really in charge of it. And that gave her a lot of confidence in her work as an artist, as a photographer. And, you know, it's a project that you could say started back when she was probably eight, ten years old when she first grabbed my digital camera out of my hands. Um, so that was a that was a very long, long project. And it's beautiful and it's going on still. So well, if that, that was one thing that you and I were really clear about when we were young, that we wanted our children to be people who would try things and fail and learn from them, learn how to be adaptable, learn how to be persistent, learn how to be determined. And so uh, you know, we, didn't, we, we knew that there were gonna be things that our children did that, would, that they would fail at and then they would learn to keep trying and do it right. And I think you might have a story about, another story about that, right? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> uh, it was kind of emotional. So, you know, a little bit of the ups and downs, like even failures don't necessarily go the way you think they might. Um, but my, my middle daughter, um, she's, she's, a, she's a grown up now, she's a violin teacher, but when she was little, um, um, she, I have three children, so my very youngest uh, was about six years younger than her. So my, my very youngest, and she was probably two, and Claire was painting a beautiful rainbow plaque. And she had spread out all the papers on the table, and it was gorgeous. All the colors in order, very, so Claire is very uh, particular and careful. She's really good at small things, and it was gorgeous. And she put everything down, and she left the table, and um, she was with me in the kitchen, I believe. And, um, and then, like about 15 minutes later, I heard her go back into the dining room look at the table, it got very quiet. It, it was so, it, the whole house had a hush to it. And I looked around the corner and her whole entire rainbow was yellow and had climbed up to the table and painted it her favorite color, yellow. So, I mean, I think about this almost every time somebody says, how do you homeschool when you have a little one in the house, a baby or, you know, a toddler? How do you do it? And I think that was such an amazing lesson for Claire to have that happen and for me to watch how she handled it. She was so strong and beautiful. She didn't, she was very upset, but she didn't take it out on anybody. She simply repainted the whole thing all again. Oh, that is so Claire. That is such a cl perfect Claire it's not story. A Claire thing to do, yeah. Um, I mean, she had such great care and she really did love her sister. And, you know, that's one of the beautiful um, benefits of homeschooling is this amazing relationship you have with your siblings, with the whole family. So that was Claire and her rainbow. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. You said it so well. So, we just wanted to take this chance to sh to go over um, both from my dear friend from my older children's uh, homeschooling experience and Renee, the dear friend of my younger children's homeschooling experiences, to talk about how this keeps being something that brings joy to families that homeschool, these epic projects. But besides joy, they seem to be such character building experiences. So we really encourage you to consider this um, because they just seem to build resiliency. They seem to build this sort of innate work ethic into kids, helping kids to realize um, their responsibility in the thing, in the things that are gonna happen. So to raise these sort of capable self-actualized resilient adults, 
These epic projects seem to be something that everyone looks back on and realizes was something that could only really happen at homeschooling. And it was very, very important for them to become these people, these you know, high quality people that they do become. So we just hope that you'll consider taking the time to do a big project and we want to thank you for listening again. Thank you if you like this video, please subscribe and uh, like our videos. We just love it when that happens. Have a great day. Keep learning on this homeschool journey and please consider an epic project for your family. Bye-bye. Thank you.